The radar ocean reconnaissance satellite, called Aurorsat, passed over the formation at 0310. Its radar transmitter noted the formation and its cameras tracked in on their wakes. Five minutes later, the data was in Moscow. Fifteen minutes after that, flight crews were given their final brief at four military air bases grouped around the city of Kirovsk on the Kola Peninsula. The crews were quiet, no less tense than their American targets. Both sides mulled over the same thoughts. This was the exercise both sides had practiced for over 15 years. Millions of hours of planning, studies, and simulations were about to be put to the test. The Badgers lifted off first, pushed by their twin Mikulin engines. Each takeoff was an effort. The bombers were so heavily loaded that the tower controllers reached out with their minds to wish every aircraft into the still morning air. Once off the ground, they headed north, forming up into loose regimental formations just north of Murmansk before heading west and skirting past the North Cape, before their slow left turns took them toward the North Atlantic. Twenty miles off the North Russian coast, USS Narwhal hovered beneath the surface of a slate gray sea. The quietest submarine in the US fleet, she was a specialized intelligence gathering platform that spent more time on the Soviet coast than did some ships in the Russian Navy. Her three thin ESM antennae were raised, as was a million dollar search periscope. Technicians aboard listened in on low power radio conversations between aircraft as they formed up. Three uniformed intelligence specialists and a civilian from the National Security Agency evaluated the strength of the raid and decided that it was large enough to risk a warning broadcast. An additional mast was raised and aimed at a communication satellite 24,000 miles away. The burst transmission lasted less than a fifteenth of a second. The message was automatically relayed to four separate communication stations and within 30 seconds was at Sackland headquarters. Five minutes after that, Toland had the yellow message form in his hand. He walked immediately to Admiral Baker and handed the message over. 0418 Zulu real-time sends warning air raid takeoff 0400 heading west from Kola, estimate five regiment plus. Baker checked his watch. Fast work. Tag. The air group commander looked at the form and walked to a phone. Shoot off the plus fives. Recall the patrol aircraft when they get to station and set up two more Tomcats and a Hummer on plus five. I want the returning aircraft turned around immediately. Reserve one catapult for tankers. He came back. With your permission, sir, I propose to put another pair of F-14s and another Hummer up in an hour and put all the fighters on plus five. At 0600, the rest of the fighters go up with tankers in support. We'll meet them with everything we have about 200 miles out and kick their ass. Very well. Comment. Svensson looked pensively at the master plot. Circles were already being drawn for the farthest possible advance of the Soviet bombers. The Brits get the same warning? Yes, sir, Toland answered. Norwegians, too. With luck, one or the other might make contact with the raid and nibble at it some maybe put a trailer with them. Nice idea, but don't count on it. If I was running the attack, I'd come way west and turn south right over Iceland. Spenson looked back at the plot. Think real time would have broadcast a warning for Bear D? My information, sir, is that they are allowed to broadcast only for three regiments or more. Ten or twenty bears wouldn't be enough. They might not even notice it. So, right now we probably have a herd of bears out there not emitting anything, just flying around listening for our radar signals. Toland nodded agreement. The battle group was a circle of ships with a radius of 30 miles. The carriers and troop ships in the center, surrounded by nine missile-armed escorts and six more specialized anti-submarine ships. None of the ships had a radar transmitter working. 
Instead, they got all their electronic information from the two circling E-2C air surveillance aircraft, known colloquially as Hummers, whose radars swept a circle over 400 miles across. The drama being played out was more complex than the most intricate game. More than a dozen variable factors could interact, with their permutations running into the thousands. Radar detection range depended on altitude and the consequent distance to the horizon that neither eyes nor radar can see past. An aircraft could avoid, or at least delay, detection by skimming the waves. But this carried severe penalties in fuel consumption and range. They had to locate the battle group without being detected by it first. The Russians knew where the carrier group was, but it would move in the four hours required for the bombers to get there. Their missiles needed precise information if they were to home in on the raid's primary target, the two American and one French carrier, or the mission was a wasted effort. Putting the group's fighters on station to intercept the incoming raid depended on expert prognostication of its direction and speed. Their job, to locate and engage the bombers before they could find the carrier. For both sides, the fundamental choice was whether or not to radiate, to use their radar transmitters. Either choice carried benefits and dangers, and there was no best solution to the problem. Nearly every American ship carried powerful air search radars that could locate the raid 200 or more miles away. But those radar signals could be detected at an even greater range, generating a return signal that would potentially allow the Soviets to circle the formation, pinpoint it, then converge in from all points of the compass. The game was hide-and-seek, played over a million square miles of ocean. The losers died. The Soviet Bear D reconnaissance bombers were passing south of Iceland. There were 10 of them, covering a front of a thousand miles. The monstrous propeller-driven aircraft were packed full of electronics gear and crewed by men with years of training and experience in locating the American carrier groups. At the nose, tail, and wingtips, sensitive antennae were already reaching out, searching for the signals from American radar transmitters. They would close on those signals, chart them with great care but remain forever outside the estimated detection radius. Their greatest fear was that the Americans would use no radar at all, or that they would switch their sets on and off at random intervals and locations, which posed the danger of the bears blundering directly into armed ships and aircraft. The bear had 20 hours of endurance, but the penalty for it was virtually no combat capability. It was too slow to run from an interceptor, and had no ability to fight one. We have located the enemy battle force, the crew's bitter joke ran. Dos Vedania Rodina. But they were a proud group of professionals. The attack bombers depended on them, as did their country. 800 miles north of Iceland, the Badgers altered their course to 180, due south at 500 knots. They had avoided the still dangerous Norwegians, and it was not thought that the British would reach this far out. These air crews kept a nervous watch out their windows, nevertheless, their own electronic sensors fully operative and under constant scrutiny. An attack by tactical fighters against Iceland was expected at any time, and the bomber crews knew that any NATO fighter pilot worthy of his name would instantly jettison his bomb load for a chance at air-to-air -air combat with so helpless a target as a 20-year-old badger. They had reached the end of their useful lives. Cracks were developing in the wings. The turbine blades in their jet engines were worn, reducing performance and fuel efficiency. 200 miles behind them, the backfire bombers were finishing their refueling operations. The Tu-22Ms had been accompanied by tankers, and after topping off their tanks, they headed south slightly west of the Badger's horse track. With an AS-6 Kingfish missile hanging under each wing, the backfires too were potentially vulnerable. But the backfire had the ability to run at high Mach numbers and stood a fair chance at survival. 
even in the face of determined fighter opposition. Their crews were the elite of Soviet naval aviation, well paid and pampered by Soviet society. Their commanders had reminded them at the regimental briefings. Now it was time to deliver. All three groups of aircraft came south at optimum cruise speed, their flight crews monitoring fuel consumption, engine heat, and many other gauges for the long overwater flight. Saratoga and Foch were visible on the horizon, perhaps eight miles away. Their size impressive even at this distance. Closer in, Ticonderoga was cutting through the five-foot seas, white painted missiles visible on her twin launchers. A few blinker lights traded signals. Otherwise, the ships in view were gray shapes without noise, waiting. Nemitz's deck was covered with aircraft. F-14 Tomcat interceptors sat everywhere. Two were hooked up on the midship's catapults, only a hundred feet from him, their two-man flight crews dozing. The fighters carried Phoenix long-range missiles. The attack bombers carried buddy store tanks instead of weapons. They'd be used to refuel the fighters in flight, enabling them to remain aloft an extra two hours. Deck crewmen in multicolored shirts scurried about, checking and rechecking the aircraft. Carrier began turning to port, coming around into the westerly wind in preparation for launching aircraft. He checked his watch, 0558. Time to get back to CIC. The carrier would go to general quarters in two minutes. Contact, the technician said over the bear's interphone. Signals indicate an American airborne radar transmitter carrier type. Give me a bearing, the pilot commanded. Patience, comrade major. The technician made an adjustment on his board. His radio interferometers timed the signals as they arrived at antennae arrayed all over the aircraft. Southeast, bearing to signal is 131. Signal strength, one. He is quite distant. Bearing is not changing as yet. I recommend we maintain a constant course for the present. Pilot and co-pilot exchanged a look, but no words. Somewhere off to their left was an American E-2C Hawkeye radar aircraft. A flight crew of two, a radar intercept officer and two radar operators. It could manage the air battle for over a hundred enemy aircraft, could vector a missile-armed interceptor in at them within seconds of detection. The pilot wondered just how accurate his information was on the Hawkeye's radar. What if they had already detected his bear? He knew the answer to that. His first warning would come when he detected the fire control radar of an American F-14 Tomcat heading right at him. The bear held course 180 while the plotting officer tracked the change in bearing to the radar signal. In 10 minutes, they might just have an accurate fix if they lived that long. They would not break radio silence until they had a fix. I have it, the plotting officer reported. Estimate distance to contact is 650 kilometers. Position 47 degrees, nine minutes north, 34 degrees, 50 minutes west. Get it out, the pilot ordered. A directional HF antenna in the aircraft's tail fin turned within its housing and radioed the information to the raid commander, whose Bear Command aircraft was 100 miles behind the snoopers. The raid commander compared this datum with that from the reconnaissance satellite. Now he had two pieces of information. The American's position three hours ago was 60 miles south of the estimated plot for the Hawkeye. The Americans probably had two of them up, northeast and northwest of the formation. That was normal fleet doctrine. So the carrier group was right about here. The Badgers were heading right for it. They would encounter the American radar coverage in two hours. Good, he said to himself. Everything is going according to plan. Toland watched the aircraft plot in silence. The radar picture from the Hawkeyes was being transmitted to the carrier by digital radio link. 
enabling the battle group commander to follow everything. The same data went to the group air defense boss on Ticonderoga, and every other ship fitted with the naval tactical data system. That included the French ships, which had long since been equipped to operate closely with the U.S. Navy. So far, there was nothing to be seen except the tracks of American military and commercial aircraft ferrying men and supplies across the ocean, and dependence back to the States. These were beginning to swing south. Warned that an air battle was possible, the pilots of DC-10s and C-5As were prudently keeping out of the way even if it meant having to land and refuel on the way to their destinations. The group's 48 Tomcat interceptors were now mostly on station, spread in a line 300 miles across. Each pair of Tomcats had a tanker aircraft in attendance. The attack birds, Corsairs and intruders, carried oversized fuel tanks with refueling boats attached and one by one, the Tomcats were already beginning to top off their fuel tanks from them. Soon the Corsairs began returning to their carriers for refills. They could keep this up for hours. The aircraft remaining on the carriers were spotted on the decks for immediate takeoff. If a raid came in, they would be shot off the catapult at once to eliminate the fire hazard inherent in any type of aircraft. Toland had seen all this before, but could not fail to be amazed by it. Everything was going as smoothly as a ballet. The aircraft loitered at their patrol stations, tracing lazy, fuel-efficient circles in the sky. The carriers were racing east now at 30 knots to make up the distance lost during launch operations. The Marines' landing ships, Saipan, Ponce, and Newport, could make only about 20 knots and were essentially defenseless. East of the group, carrier S-3A Viking and landing-based P-3C Orion anti-submarine aircraft were patrolling for Soviet submarines. They reported to the group ASW commander on the destroyer Caron. There was as yet nothing for anyone to direct his frustration against. The old story known to all fighting men. You wait. The raid commander was rapidly accumulating data. He now had positions on four American Hawkeyes. The first two had barely been plotted when the second pair had showed up, outside and south of the first. The Americans had unwittingly given him a very accurate picture of where the battle group was, and the steady eastward drift of the Hawkeyes gave him force and speed. His bears were now in a wide semicircle around the Americans, and the Badgers were 30 miles north of American radar cover, 400 miles north of the estimated location of the ships. Send to Group A. Enemy formation at grid coordinates 456-810. Speed 20. Course 100. Execute attack plan A at 0615 Zulu time. Send the same to Group B. Tactical control of Group B switches to Team East coordinator. The battle had begun. The Badger crews exchanged looks of relief. They had detected the American radar signals 15 minutes before and knew that each kilometer south meant a greater chance that they would run into a cloud of enemy fighters. Aboard each aircraft, the navigator and bombardier worked quickly to feed strike information into the Kelt missiles slung under each wing. 800 miles to their southwest, the backfire crews advanced their throttle slightly, plotting a course to the datum point supplied by the raid command. Having circled far around the American formation, they would now be controlled by the strike officer aboard the first fair to make electronic contact with the Hawkeye. They had a solid fix on the NATO formation, but they needed better if they were to locate and engage the carriers. These crews were not relieved, but excited. Now came the challenging part. The battle plan had been formulated a year before and practiced over land exclusively five times. Four times it had worked. Aboard 80 Badger bombers, pilots checked their watches counting off the seconds to 0615 Zulu.
Launch. The lead badger launched eight seconds early. First one, then the second aircraft shaped help dropped three of its pylons, falling several hundred feet before their turbojet engines ran up to full power. Running on autopilot, the Celts climbed back to 30,000 feet and cruised on south at 600 knots indicated airspeed. The bomber crews watched their birds proceed for a minute or two. Then each of the bombers turned slowly and gracefully for all. Their mission done. Six Badger J standoff jamming aircraft continued south. They would stay 60 kilometers behind the Celts. Their crews were nervous but confident. It would not be easy for American radar to burn through their powerful jammers. And in any case, the Americans would soon have many targets to concern them. The Celts continued on, straight and level. They carried their own electronic equipment, which would be triggered automatically by sensors in their tail fins. When they entered the theoretical arc of the Hawkeye's radar range, transponders in their noses clicked on. Radar contacts. Designate Raid 1, bearing 349er, range 460 miles. Numerous contacts. Count 140 contacts, course 175, speed 600 knots. The master tactical scope plotted the contacts electronically, and a pair of plexiglass plates showed another visual display. So, here they come, Baker said quietly. Right on time. The computer display went white. Clipper base, this is Hawk 3. We're getting some jamming, reported the senior airborne control officer. We plot six, possibly seven jammers, bearing 340 to 030. Pretty powerful stuff. Estimate we have standoff jammers, but no escort jammers. Contacts are lost for the present. Estimate burn through in 10 minutes. Request weapons free and release to vector intercept. Baker looked over to his air operations officer. Let's get things started. Air Ops nodded and picked up a microphone. Hawk 3, this is Clipper Base. Weapons free. I say again, weapons are free. Release authority is granted. Flash me some bombers. Out. Svensson frowned at the display. Admiral, we're coming about from your decks. I recommend the formation stays together now. He got a nod. Clipper Fleet, this is Clipper Base. Come left to 270. Launch all remaining aircraft. Execute. On the single command, the formation made a 180 degree left turn. Those ships that did not as yet have missiles on their launchers rectified this. Fire control radars were trained north but kept in standby mode. 30 different captains waited for the word to activate. Something's wrong, sir. The radar operator on Hawk 1 motioned to his scope. We have these buggers just popped through, and they say they bagged some. Gotta be three, four hundred miles away. Clipper Base, this is Hawk 1. We just had contact with an Air Force ferry flight eastbound. They claim they just splashed five badgers northbound several hundred miles north of us. Say again, northbound. Holland's eyebrows went up. Probably some had to abort. Baker observed. This is close to their fuel limit, isn't it? Yes, sir, replied Air Ops. He didn't look happy with his own answer. Burn through, announced the radar operator. We have reacquired the targets. The Celts had flown on, oblivious to the furor around them. Their radar transponders made them look like 110-foot badgers. Their own white noise jammers came on somewhat obscuring them yet again on the radar scopes, and autopilot controls began to jerk them up, down, left, right, in hundred-meter leaps as an aircraft might do when trying to avoid a missile. The Celts had been real missiles once, but on retirement from frontline service six years earlier, their warheads had been replaced with additional fuel tankage, and they had been relegated to a role as target drones, a purpose they were serving admirably now. Tally-ho! The first squadron of 12 Tomcats was now 150 miles away. The Celts showed up perfectly on radar, and the intercept officers in the back seat of each fighter quickly established target tracks. The 
scouts were approaching what would have been nominal missile launch distance, if they were the bombers everyone thought they were. The Tomcats launched a volley of million-dollar AIM 54C Phoenix missiles at a range of 140 miles. The missiles blazed in on their targets at Mach 5, directed by the fighters targeting radars. In under a minute, the 48 missiles had killed 39 targets. The first squadron broke clear as the second came into launch position. Admiral, something is wrong here. Tolan said quietly. What might that be? Baker liked the way things were going. Enemy bomber tracks were being wiped off his screen just as the war games had predicted they would. The Russians are coming in dumb, sir. So? So this far the Soviets have not been very dumb. Admiral, why aren't the backfires going supersonic? Why one attack group? Why one direction? Fuel constraints. Baker answered. The badges are at the limit of their fuel. They have to come in direct. But not the backfires. The course is right. The raid count is right. Baker shook his head and concentrated on the tactical plot. The second squadron of fighters had just launched. Unable to get a head-on shot, their missile accuracy suffered somewhat. They killed 34 targets with 48 missiles there had been 157 targets plotted. The third and fourth Tomcat squadrons arrived together and launched as a group. When their phoenixes had been fully expended, 19 targets were left. The two fighter squadrons moved in to engage the remaining targets with their cannon. Clipper base, this is Sam Boss. We're going to have some leakers. Recommend we start lighting up Sam radars. Roger, Sam Boss. Permission granted answered the group tactical warfare coordinator. I have air search radars bearing 037, the bear ESM officer noted. They have detected us. Recommend we illuminate also. The bear lit off its big bulge look-down radar. New radar contact. Designate raid 2. What? snapped Baker. Next came a call from the fighters. Clipper base, this is Slugger lead. I have a visual on my target. The squadron commander was trying to examine the target on his long-range TV camera. When he spoke, the anguish in his voice was manifest. Warning, warning, this is not a badger. We've been shooting at Kelt missiles. Ray 2 is 73 aircraft bearing 217, range 130 miles. We have a big bolt radar tracking the formation, said the CIC talker. Toland cringed as the new contacts were plotted. Admiral, we've been had. The group tactical warfare officer was pale as he toggled his microphone. Air warning red. Weapons free. Threat axis is 217. All ships turn as necessary to unmask batteries. The Tomcats had all been drawn off, leaving the formation practically naked. The only armed fighters over the formation were Kosha's eight crusaders, long since retired from the American inventory. On a terse command from their carrier, they went to afterburner and rocketed southwest toward the backfires. Too late. The bear already had a clear picture of the American formations. The Russians could not determine ship type, but they could tell large from small and identify the missile cruiser Ticonderoga by her distinctive radar emissions. The carriers would be close to her. The bear relayed the information to her consorts. A minute later, the 70 backfire bombers launched their 140 AS-6 Kingfish missiles and turned north at full military power. The Kingfish was nothing like the Kelt. Powered by a liquid fuel rocket engine, it accelerated to 900 knots and began its descent. Its radar homing head tracking on a pre-programmed target area 10 miles wide. Every ship in the center of the formation had several missiles assigned. Vampire! Vampire! The CIC talker said aboard Ticonderoga. We have numerous incoming missiles. Weapons free. The group anti-air warfare officer ordered the cruiser's Aegis weapons system into full automatic mode. 
Tycho had been built with this exact situation in mind. Her powerful radar computer system immediately identified the incoming missiles as hostile and assigned each a priority of destruction. The computer was completely on its own, free to fire on its electronic will at anything diagnosed as a threat. Numbers, symbols, and vectors paraded across the master tactical display. The fore and aft twin missile launchers trained out at the first targets and awaited the orders to fire. Aegis was state of the art, the best SAM system yet devised. But it had one major weakness. Tycho carried only 96 SM-2 surface-to-air missiles. There were 140 incoming Kingfish. The computer had not been programmed to think about that. Aboard Nimitz, Toland could feel the carrier heeling into a radical turn. Her engines advanced to flank speed, driving the massive warship at over 35 knots. Her nuclear-powered escorts, Virginia and California, were also tracking the Kingfish. Their own missiles trained out on their launchers. The Kingfish were at 100 miles out, covering a mile every four seconds. Each had now selected a target, choosing the largest within their fields of view. Nimitz was the nearest large ship, with her missile ship escorts to her north. Tycho launched her first quartet of missiles as the targets reached a range of 99 miles. The rockets exploded into the air, leaving a trail of pale gray smoke. They had barely cleared the launch rails when the mounts went vertical and swiveled to receive their reloads. The load and fire time was under eight seconds. The cruiser would average one missile fired every two seconds. Just over three minutes later, her missile magazines were empty. The cruiser emerged from the face of an enormous gray arch of smoke. Her only remaining defenses were her gun systems. The SAMs raced in at their targets with a closing speed of over 2,000 miles per hour, directed in by the reflected waves of the ship's own fire control radars. The Aegis system did quite well. Just over 60% of the targets were destroyed. There were now 82 incoming missiles targeted on a total of eight ships. Other missile-equipped ships joined the fray. In several cases, two or three missiles were sent for the same target, usually killing it. The number of incoming vampires dropped to 70, then 60 but the number was not dropping quickly enough. The identity of the targets was now known to everyone. Powerful, active jamming equipment came on. Ships began a radical series of maneuvers, like some stylized dance, with scant attention paid to station people. The radar picture on Nimitz suddenly was obscured. What had been discrete tips designating the positions of ships in the formation became shapeless clouds. Only the missiles stayed constant. Inverted V-shapes with line vectors to designate direction and speed. The last wave of SAMs killed three more. The vampire count was down to 41. The next Kingfish approached the carrier's bow and was blasted out of the sky by the forward CIWS too close aboard. Fragments ripped across the carrier's deck, killing a dozen exposed crewmen. Number three was decoyed by a chaff cloud and ran straight into the sea half a mile behind the carrier. The warhead caused the carrier to vibrate and raised a column of water a thousand feet into the air. The fourth and fifth missiles came in from aft not a hundred yards apart. The aftergun mount tracked on both, but couldn't decide which to engage first. It went into reset mode and petulantly didn't engage any. The missiles hit within a second of one another, one on the afterport corner of the flight deck, the other on the number two arrestor wire. The carrier pilots had all heard their ship go off the air and were consumed with rage at what had happened. No longer the cool professionals who drove fighters off ships. USS Caron, the senior undamaged ship, 
tracked the Russians on her radar, calling Britain for fighters to intercept them on the trip home. But the Russians had anticipated this and detoured far west of the British Isles, meeting their tankers 400 miles west of Norway. Already the Russians were evaluating the results of their mission. The first major battle of modern carriers and missile-armed bombers had been won and lost. Both sides knew which was which. <laughs> 